navigate it. Here's what I discovered that happens to you in life, that you will go through things and while you're going through them, you can't understand why it's happening to you. But after you go through it, you get back and you look at it and you say, oh, now I understand why I needed that lesson. You can touch millions of people's lives and the world will never be the same again because you came this way. And as he talked, my heart began to beat fast. Tears began to run by my eyes and, and I was in the back just listening to him because the speech he was giving, that speech was for me. For 14 years, I procrastinated. How many of you thought about something you wanted to do and you stopped you from doing it? Raise your hands, please. And you are sitting, you are sitting out there like a wimp because I represent the thoughts you have rejected for yourself. I heard that, I said, oh God, it's talking to me. Life is hard. See, it's hard when, when you are 49 years old, been working on a job for 17 years, and they come in and tell you, you're finished, and give you one week severance pay. And you gotta start all over again. It's hard when you are married and raising children and your children are crawling and your husband dies unexpectedly. It's hard handling just the tragedies of life. It's hard when you're working on something and, and you put everything you have in it and it doesn't work out, you lose your money and other people's money. It's hard. It was rough when I lost my job and I could not find a job. It was humiliating and embarrassing, borrowing money, and then I couldn't pay the money back when I told them I would. That's rough. How people look at you, how they respond to you. It's very hard. It's humiliating. Here's what I discovered that happens to you in life, that you will go through things, and while you're going through them, you can't understand why it's happening to you. But after you go through it, you get back and you look at it and you say, oh, now I understand why I needed that lesson. Have it ever happened to you? Raise your hand. Has it ever happened to you that, that I, did, I couldn't understand it then? But after I got through it, then I saw that that was preparing me for bigger and better things. As you go through the challenges of life and you look at it and embrace whatever comes to you, don't run from it. Step toward it. Don't try and duck it like most people do. See, most people want it easy. See, easy come, easy what? Easy go. See, but when you go at what you're going to deal with and you deal with the difficulties of it, when you handle those hard things close at hand, making those hard decisions right now that you don't want to make, learning those things that you don't like to do, but you know that in order for you to get where you want to go, this is one of the hoops that you have to flip through. And I'm saying to you, whatever you got to do, do it, because if you don't, life is going to whoop you until you surrender and say, okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. I cooperate, okay, I learned, okay. They had to wear me out a long time. So if it's hard, then do it hard. Now, you, how do you hang in there during the hard, difficult times? Les, you must have faith. You've got to believe in yourself. You've got to believe in your abilities. You've got to believe in your service, your company, your ideas, unquestionably. You've got to have faith, and that faith gives you patience. That it's not going to happen as quickly as you want it to happen. A lot of things are going to happen that will catch you off guard. And so therefore, you've got to deal with and handle it as it comes. And not only that, but that faith and patience drives you into action. You've got to keep moving and keep plugging away. In the Far East, they have something that's called the Chinese bamboo tree. The Chinese bamboo tree takes five years to grow. They have to water and fertilize the ground where it is every day. And it doesn't break through the ground until the fifth year. But once it breaks through the ground, within five weeks, it grows 90 feet tall. 
Now the question is, does it grow 90 feet tall in five weeks or five years? The answer is obvious. It grows 90 feet tall in five years. Because at any time, had that person stopped watering and nurturing and fertilizing that dream, that bamboo tree would have died in the ground. And I can see people coming out talking to a guy out there watering and fertilizing the ground that's not showing anything. Hey, what you doing? You've been out here a long time, man. And the conversation in the neighborhood is, you growing a Chinese bamboo tree, is that right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, um, even Ray Charles and Stephen Wonder can see ain't nothing showing. <laughs> you know that's how people are gonna do you? So how long you been working on this? How long have you been working on your dream? It's good. And you have nothing to show, this is all you got to show? People are gonna do that to you. And some people, ladies and gentlemen, they stop. Because they don't see instant results. It doesn't happen quickly. They stop. Oh, no, 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 no. You got to keep on watering your dream. And when it began to happen, they stop laughing. They said, look, whoa, look, look here. It's, look, look up. Hey, man, you know, I know you could do it. Look here, you got a job here? <laughs> see, t during those hard times, we didn't know how you're gonna make payroll during those times when you fell and, and, and things didn't work out. They were, they were nowhere to be found. But you know what I discovered? When you're working at your dream, somebody said the heart of the battle, the sweet of the victory. Oh, it's sweet to you. It's good to you, why? See, when, you, when it's hard and there's a struggle, see, what you become in the process is more important than the dream. That's far more important. The kind of person you become, the character that you build, the courage that you develop, the faith that you're manifesting. Oh, it's, it's something that you get up in the morning, you look yourself in the mirror, you're a different kind of person. You walk with a different kind of spirit. People know that you know what life is, that you have embraced life. You knew it was hard, but you did it hard. Begin to know that you have greatness within you. And if just one of you here begin to envision yourselves as being blessed and highly favored to reach your goals, if just one of you capture the essence of what that means, that you have greatness within you and a responsibility to manifest that greatness, that you can make your parents proud, you can make your school proud, you can touch millions of people's lives and the world will never be the same again because you came this way. It was hard, ladies and gentlemen, coming to speak to people. And I was facing financial difficulties in my own life. I was behind on my bills and my dreams and I'm saying to them, you can live your dream. It was hard, ladies and gentlemen. It was very difficult to pick myself up each day believing that I could do it. There were times that I doubted myself. I used to ask myself, can I do this? And something said within me, you're the one. Don't give up on your dream. By continuing to push forward, by continuing to run toward my dream, that one day I would have my own talk show. It's a long shot, ladies and gentlemen, from Liberty City, an abandoned building on a floor never knowing my mother or father. It's a long shot being here with you today in this dome in Atlanta. It's a long shot. No college training, labeled, educable, mentally retarded, but I kept running toward my dream. Don't stop. Don't stop running toward your dream. Does identified as mentally retarded, put back from the fifth grade into the fourth grade and stayed in that category until I got out of high school. I don't have any college training, but I met a high school teacher who one day changed my life. I was waiting on another student, and when he came in, he said to me, young man, go to the board and write what I'm about to tell you. And I said, I, I can't do that, sir. He said, why not? I said, I'm not one of your students. He said, it doesn't matter, follow my directions now. I said, I can't do that, sir. He said, why not? I said, because I'm educable, mentally retarded. And he came from behind his desk and he looked at me. 
He said, don't ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. And as he talked, my heart began to beat fast. Tears began to run by my eyes and, and I was in the back just listening to him because the speech he was giving, that speech was for me. And he said, Les Brown, he said, if you want to do anything worthwhile in life, you've got to be hungry. I told Mr. Washington I wanted to become a disc jockey. And so I started working to develop myself. He said, I want you to practice every day being a disc jockey. I said, but I don't have any job now. He said, it doesn't matter. He said that it's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. And as I was working to develop myself, I applied for a job as a disc jockey, WMB on Miami Beach. I went to a guy named Milton Butterball. I said, how you doing, Mr. Butterball? I'd like to get a job as a disc jockey. He looked at me, he said, you have any broadcast background? I said, no, sir, I don't. You have any journalism background? I said, no, sir, I don't. He said, we don't have any jobs available. I said, yes, sir. I went back to Mr. Washington and I told him, he said, don't take it personally. He said, most people are so negative, they will have to say no seven times before they say yes. He said, go back again. So I went back again. I said, how you doing, Mr. Butterball? My name is Les Brown. He said, I know what your name is. What do you want? I said, I'd like to know whether or not you have any jobs at this jockey, sir. He said, didn't I just tell you yesterday we didn't have any jobs? I said, yes, sir, but I know whether or not somebody got laid off or somebody was fired, sir. He said, no one was laid off or fired. Now get on out of here. I came back the next day like I was seeing him for the first time. I said, hello, Mr. Butterball. How are you? He looked at me with rage. He said, go get me some coffee. I said, yes, sir. And I went to get him some coffee. After a while, I would give them lunch and dinner and I would go in the control rooms and take the disc jockeys their food and I would not leave until they would ask me to leave. One Saturday afternoon, while I was at the radio station, a guy named Rock was drinking while he was on the air. I was the only one there looking at him through the control room windows, walking back and forth, young, ready, and hungry. Pretty soon the phone rang and it was the general manager. And I answered the phone. I said, hello. He said, Les, this is Mr. Klein. I said, I know. He said, Rock can't finish his program. I said, I know. He said, would you call one of the other DJs in? I said, yes, sir. I hung the phone up. I said, now he must be think I'm crazy. I called my mom and my girlfriend, Cassandra. I said, y'all turn up the radio and come out on the front porch. I'm about to come on the air. I waited for about 20 minutes, and I called him back. I said, Mr. Klein, I can't find nobody. He said, young boy, do you know how to work the controls? I said, yes, sir. He said, go in there and don't say nothing here. I said, yes, sir. I couldn't wait to get behind those controls. I put on an old Stevie Wonder record called Fingertips. I sat down behind that turntable. I said, look out, this is me, LB, Triple P. Les Brown, your platter playing popper. There were none before me, and there will be none after me. Therefore, that makes me the one and only. Young and single and love to mingle, certified, bona fide, and dubitably qualified to bring you satisfaction, a whole lot of action. Look out, baby, I'm your love man. I was hungry. I was hungry. You gotta be hungry. If you are suffering from any kind of incurable disease, please call this number right now and order your miracle prayer cloth. I said, listen to this foolishness. I'm about to hit the channel. And the guy said, I had prostate cancer. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> and I got that prayer cloth. I went at home and, and I put it on my body and I was healed in the name of Jesus. This prayer cloth, only $3. I said to man $100 and say, send me a prayer blanket. <laughs> I was running scared. Remember going to Detroit and went to this healer. They said this lady had healing hands. I went there and a friend of mine named Rudy, he came in on the cane and I knew he was in an accident, had pinched nerve. And he was one of the people she pulled out of the audience. And she brought Rudy up there. He came up there with his cane. She said, what's wrong with you? He said, I got a pinched nerve. She said, where? My back here. I was in an accident. My back had been right for five years. She said, touch your toes. He said, oh, I can't do that. I, 
I'm in too much pain. She said, I said, touch your toes in the name of Jesus. He went down, wham! I said, whoa, I got up and got in line. <laughs> By the time I got up there, she said, what's your problem? I said, I got cancer. I said, but just touch me on the head. It'll go through my whole body. Just <laughs> touch me right now and it'll go through my... She said, where, boy, is the cancer? I said, I got prostate cancer. He said, touch him, Jesus. Touch him, touch him. <laughs> I was running everywhere trying to get some help. When I was diagnosed with prostate cancer, I was given a two to three year prognosis. I went in a cave. I was embarrassed to come out. I was going through a divorce and then I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. I was out of my mind. I wasn't myself. How many of you know if you had your life to live over again, you could have done more than what you've done thus far? One night I'm looking at television. I see these young guys on television using all kind of profanity. And I was looking down them at my nose saying, look at this, this is horrible. And as I sat there in the dark in my foot of loom underwear, God asked, what are you doing here on the couch talking about them? There's never been a statue erected to a critic. What are you doing here? I gave you Mamie Brown. I took you out of your biological mother's womb and placed you in the heart of your adopted brother. I saved you from prostate cancer. 14 years ago, they gave you two to three years. I gave you the gift of word to inspire. Here you are sitting in the dark, looking at these young boys, and they got somebody to buy into their dream. They got somebody to invest in their script. They got a cast, they got a crew, they got cameras, they got studios, they got it in theaters, they got it on television. You should be on television and they should be on a couch watching you. What are you doing here? For 14 years, I procrastinated. How many of you thought about something you wanted to do and you stopped you from doing it? Raise your hands, please. And as we begin to look at ourselves, look at our goals, look at our dreams, and many of us hide out in excuses, as I did for 14 years, I wasn't a vessel, I wasn't a channel for blessings. My Angelo said, all of us go so far, and then we paw, we paw, we take some hits, we have some defeats, we have some disappointments, and we stop dead on our track. You are a king. Kings don't run. Kings rule. Kings don't hide out in a king. Kings have dominion. What are you doing here? I was labeled educable, mentally retarded. I was feeling within myself that I was a failure, that I, I'm slower than most people. And sometimes they would laugh, look at him. He's bathing in the bathroom upstairs on the 21st floor. He sleeps on the floor. Him and two other dreamers up there. Look at them. That impacted me to such an extent that compromised my ability to think clearly. And I was at an event, Bob Proctor and another speaker came up to speak. And this guy stopped in the middle of his presentation and I felt he was talking to me. He said, there's someone here. He said, you know who you are. He said, I do this because I love it. I like to make a lot of money, but you, you love to help people and you got the gift, but you've convinced yourself you can. It's not what you don't have, it's what you think you need that keeps you from coming up here, holding this mic, changing lives like you're born to do. I mean, so I'm gonna say this and I'm not saying anything else. I'm standing in your dream. And the reason I'm standing up here holding this microphone and you are sitting, you are sitting out there like a wimp because I represent the thoughts you have rejected for yourself. I heard that, I said, oh God, he's talking to me. I got up, I ran outside to a payphone. I called Mike Williams, I said, Mike! He said, Brownie, what's wrong? I said, listen to me, Mike. Mike, are you listening to me? He said, yes. I said, I'm not rejecting myself anymore. Do you hear me? Mike, he said, Brownie, take it easy. Mike, listen to me. I'm not rejecting myself anymore. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. It's been keeping me up at night. 
And this guy said, I'm rejecting myself. I'm stopping now. Will you come help me? He says, yes, Brownie. You're as good as those guys, man. This is your calling, man. This is you. He ignited something in my heart. He's my mentor for 49 years. When I came out to California and they had my name up in lights and a giant sized picture of me, I had this overwhelming feeling, oh my God, I've made it. And Mike Williams, he was walking behind me and he said, Brownie, this is not the mountaintop. No one could have convinced me that after just over six years, I would have my own book entitled Live Your Dreams. Just over six years, I would have five specials on public television. I will now have my own talk show that will premiere on Monday, Labor Day. I'm saying to you, your dream is possible. So I learned the value of relationship capital, having relationships with people that you can learn from. Practice OQP, only quality people. Muhammad Ali said, I'm the greatest, but he never won a championship without Angelo Dundee. Michael Jordan, one of the greatest basketball players of all times. However, every championship, Phil Jackson was there. Sometimes you need to believe in somebody's belief in you until your belief kicks in. That he believed in me when I was struggling. And I believe that all of us need mentors because you can't see the picture when you're in the frame. You need someone with a trained eye, someone who can lead you to a place within yourself that you can never go by yourself. You have the potential for greatness. You have the ability to do more than you can ever begin to imagine. Doesn't matter what they're saying about you. Doesn't matter because you failed this test. Doesn't matter because you're not good in math. That you can't do calculus, algebra. Those things don't define you. You're greater than you think you are. Practice the principle of OQP, only quality people. It's necessary that you get the losers out of your life. Consistency of work. Monday, get better. Tuesday, get better. Wednesday, get better, right? And you do that over a period of time, you know, not like one month or two months. I mean, it's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years, and then you, you, know, you can get to where you want to go.